There was a very exciting development in Nova Scotia at the end of February. On February 22nd, 2019, Lindsay Trask of Digby, Nova Scotia posted a video on a Facebook group called We Love Nova Scotia, portraying what she claimed were three cougars. Retired biologist Bob Bancroft looked into the event along with Andrew Hebda, curator of the Nova Scotia Natural History Museum, and they both concluded that the video did indeed portray cougars. Exactly what kind is less clear. It has long been debated that the eastern cougar may be extinct, and there are cougars to the far south as well as the west and northwest. Were these cougars immigrants from one of those regions? Were they cougars at all? It turns out, despite the agreements of experts on the matter, there remains some debate. I have been tracking and studying wildlife behavior for a lifetime. In my undergraduate years, I briefly majored in biology, but changed my major to psychology when I developed an interest in animal personalities and intelligence. I thought now would be the time to take the skills acquired from that background and weigh in on the matter. I believe the footage was caught with a cell phone. Cell phones have notoriously poor sensors because they are very small, only about the size of a period at the end of a sentence but they do capture good megapixels and give us some useful information. Here's our original footage. We'll discuss it after we watch it. I came across the video almost as soon as it appeared on the internet. Google, aware of my constant searches for data on wildlife, suggested it to me that afternoon. I admit, I initially thought the footage portrayed only three moderately sized domestic cats, but I decided to look further into the matter. I emailed Lindsay Trask, who shot the video, to ask her for original footage from the camera, but I haven't yet heard back from her. So I downloaded a full 1080p resolution copy from the internet, the highest resolution YouTube had to offer. From that, I rendered two new versions. One was zoomed in on the animals. The other was zoomed in and also contrast enhanced. The limitation of this process of contrast enhancing is that YouTube eliminates much of the non-visible data that might otherwise be developed from original footage. But the zoomed only render nevertheless showed the three cats in question more clearly. The zoom and contrast enhanced version showed their pelts more clearly for several seconds. Before we analyze the video, let's systematically review the data that it offers. This methodological approach is how a scientific tracker bases interpretation of the data at hand. And it is a much more reliable process than looking at the grand image for the whole picture of what it seems to portray, especially since videos and photographs can be deceiving. Let's examine the imagery that Lindsay Trask produced. You can see that she filmed the imagery during a snowstorm. You can see there is heavy snow falling, and in the video movement, you can see that there is a wind happening. Now, this is very relevant because the depth of the snow can be used to give us clues about the size of the wildcats. You see, we cannot really use the video itself to give us clues about the size of the cats. One, they're simply too far away, and we cannot be certain about the scale of those trees in the background. And when Lindsay zooms in on the cats, that also doesn't help us because we don't really know the size of those trees. Are those big trees or relatively small trees in the background? Many studies have been done on a human being's ability to judge distance, and even when we're looking out at the real world, we have a very limited ability to judge distance and considerable inaccuracy in our judgments. When we're trying to convert what we see in a two-dimensional field, which is a video or a photo, into distance judgments, we are much worse. Also, when a camera zooms in, it flattens the image so that distances seem to be closer than they actually are. That can throw us off and make us think that large objects are small, or conversely, it can make distance objects seem to be much bigger than what they really are. Like when you shoot a photo of a couple on a beach with the sun in the background, the sun looks enormous because zooming in on the couple brings the couple in a little bit, but it brings the sun in an awful lot. What we do see here, though, is that on this stormy day, there is this bridge-like structure in the background. 
And if you look closely at the bridge-like structure, you'll see that there is snow trapped between the lattice work of the bridge. Those look to be either two by threes or three by fours. It's heavy boarding, I'm not sure which it is. There's at least two or three inches of snow trapped between the lattice work, but the boards themselves don't have much snow on them. This tells us that the snow is being blown away in exposed areas, but it's piling up in sheltered areas and it's at least two, maybe three inches deep. Now back in the trees where the cats were moving, there won't be much movement of the snow because trees will shelter the land from the wind. So the snow will get to pile up more there. Based on my own experience of snow piling up in wooded areas, I'd say it's a safe bet that the snow there is going to be at least three or four inches deep and possibly as much as six inches deep. Now what's very interesting is when you watch these cats move down the slope, the snow only goes up to their knees. That's very relevant because it means that there are several inches between the knees and the chest. Now a typical cat only has about a hand breadth or about four inches of space between the lower part of its barrel or torso and the ground. If these cats are walking through three or four inches of snow and there are several inches of space between the snow and the lower part of their barrels, that means their barrels are at least five, possibly as much as eight inches high over the ground, at least according to the only really reliable scale, which is snow depth. Admittedly, it is possible I wrongly estimated the depth. Sometimes snow can be very well sheltered out by the canopy of tree cover, especially among evergreens. I've seen evergreen woods where a snowstorm is going on and yet there is almost no snow underneath but eventually the snow does work its way under. The snow will build up on the evergreens. The wind blows, it sifts through, it works its way under. And when the wind blows and clears the snow out from the exposed areas, the snow that has built up in the sheltered area remains and the depth increases. So I really believe, especially after having watched this video for a couple of hours over and over again, that the snow depth where the cats are walking is at least three inches and probably more, probably four inches or so deep. So the cats that we're seeing move over the snow, their barrels are at least five to eight inches above the ground. Some persons have also argued that they appear to be moving in little steps like one would see from a domestic cat. What I believe they are overlooking is the terrain is very steep. And when terrain is steep, animals reduce the distance between their steps. Quadrupeds, that is animals with four legs, tend to walk in direct register movement where the ground is level and they can move easily. This means that they place their hind feet directly into the space or very close to directly into the space where their front feet just were. This is a safer way and a more energy efficient way for them to move. But when the terrain is steep, quadrupeds often move in indirect register movements, which means they are not placing their hind feet into the spaces previously occupied by their front feet because they have to move in smaller steps. Now humans, we're bipeds, but we also do this too. When we're moving up a steep incline, we walk in little steps. This is a form of leverage. It allows us to put out less energy per step to get us moving up. And when we're walking downhill, we also walk in closer steps than we would on level ground. And this is being cautious. The ground is steep, so we're not allowing ourselves to build up much momentum as we go down the hill in case we trip ourselves up, stumble on a rock or something like that, we're more likely to be able to gain control of ourselves. We don't realize that's what we're doing, but in, but in terms of balance and instinct, that is in fact what we're doing. If the animals were varying their gait, it's going to create irregularities in their trails and it's going to create more prints on the trail than one would see if the cats were moving in only a direct register gait. Trackers use the space between paws as clues to indicate the size of the animals. In the soft medium of the snow, combined with the snowstorm, it would soon be impossible to tell what were front paws and what were back paws, and it would become impossible to tell the size of the animals from their tracks. This is relevant because some have argued against the likelihood that these are cougars based on the spacing of the tracks. The original video portrays the animals as too small to make out too much detail, but some useful information is conveyed in it, and the zoomed and high contrast versions, which we'll take a look at shortly, convey even more information. They reveal that the three animals that were portrayed were clearly feline, 
Unfortunately, the one suspected of being an adult female was portrayed only for a few seconds and not clearly. The animals did have long tails. The contrast enhanced video revealed at least one to have a tawny pelt matching that common to the North American cougar. And I could swear in one or two frames, the end of one of those tails was the dark black that is characteristic of cougars. Their fur appeared to be short but thick, indicating a dense undercoat. The one believed to be the adult female was far to the left and appeared aware of being observed and was more conservative in movement. The two suspected of being juveniles, possibly adolescents, led the group. They moved in walking gates, crisper and more quickly, with less presented awareness of observation or caution regarding the dog barking in the foreground. So with all of this background in mind, here's my interpretation of the event. Snow often blows off clear ground but remains in well-treed woods. Given the snow accumulation on the sheltered spaces of the bridge, we can assume the snowfall buildup in the woods through which the cats moved was between 2 and 3 inches. However, given that accumulation in sheltered areas would not blow away in heavily treed terrain, the snowfall was probably more. By experience, I would estimate the snowfall among the trees to be between 3 and 4 inches. The lower barrel of the cats, presumed to be juveniles, was well clear of the snow, and at 7 seconds in, the zoom rendition of my footage, the snowfall appears to only make it to the knee of one of the juveniles. This indicates 5 to 8 inches between the lower barrel and ground, and is too large for any domestic cat I am aware of, except perhaps the Maine Coon. However, the high contrast render showed the pelt of at least one of the cats was a relatively uniform tawny and inconsistent with Maine Coon coloration. The pelts also appeared short but dense, also inconsistent with Maine Coon pelts. The three cats were moving as a group. Domestic cats may group at times in colonies or to socialize, but are typically solitary hunters. The cats moved in the manner of wild animals. They were portrayed for less than a minute, but appeared to be moving in a relatively straight direction, one behind the other. Wild animals favor direct movements which conserve calories. They are disinclined to the ambling and wandering of domestic pets. Wild animals moving through snow and other dense terrain will often move over the trail broken by a preceding animal. This also conserves calories. The second juvenile appeared to be moving along the trail of the first juvenile in the manner of wild animals. The behavior pattern of the group is consistent with Bancroft's and Hebda's interpretations of a female and two juveniles. The animal interpreted as the adult on the far left moves in a more experienced and more cautious manner. The animal is clearly aware of the dog barking and quite possibly of being observed and is more cautious. The juveniles moved in typical agile feline fashion but lacked the caution one would see in an experienced adult. Given all of this, I conclude that the most relevant data portrayed in Trask's video indicates in favor of a cougar interpretation. I would place my confidence in this interpretation at about 70%. There are weaknesses portrayed in Trask's video though. We can't really be sure of the size of the animals. And there's no good information on the tracks, and that would be very telling. But the snow was soft, and there was an active snowstorm going on. What tracks there were would have been soon lost and even more quickly corrupted. Even a very experienced tracker probably would not have been able to make much of the tracks after only a half hour or so. But even without Tras video, I am convinced that cougars are back in eastern Canada on the basis of spore that I have encountered three times in the backwoods of Nova Scotia. On one occasion, the spore consisted of a large predator's scat with white-tailed deer hairs in it and bone shavings which is something that you would see in cougar scat. On another occasion, the spore consisted of very large feline tracks that I found in an old growth hemlock forest. But the best spore that I ever encountered, I found in 2016. And I've included a clip of that video here. Let's take a look at it. This is a very interesting sight. I'm back in a fairly remote old forest here in Nova Scotia and what we have here is a site where a fairly large animal nearly a meter long from four paws from four paws here to hind paws there the animal defecated which you can see right over there the animal scraped a good bit trying to throw litter over its feces. 
This is feline behavior. And this is a fairly large patch of spore here. I've come across panther spore back in this forest in the remoter areas before. And I think I've just happened upon it again. This is quite a find. There have been a few panther findings in the last two years in Nova Scotia. And the spore I came across dates back five, six years, so I know they've been here longer. They're just very secretive and remote. And I think they're in the area. Now, through the forest, that way, toward the southwest, unfortunately, there is an area where loggers have been cutting the old forest, and it's roughly a square mile in size. There had been a stable den of remote coyotes there. There had been at least two black bears that lived in the area. And I wouldn't be surprised if there had been a panther in this area too, and they've been disturbed and displaced. I know that the bears and the coyotes have been disturbed and displaced. It is roughly five feet from the forepaws to the hindpaws to the area of defecation right here. This is definitely the feces of a large predator. And it's been eating meat lately. And if you look closely, you can see that there's rabbit droppings there and there. Which is not to say that it killed this rabbit, that's unlikely. But this is an abundant year, it's we're high up we're near the peak of the rabbit cycle in this area right now and there are snowshoe hares everywhere. The feces of an animal can tell you a lot about what's going on in its life. This animal has been eating meat, it's been eating well. I'm going to break it up. There's some small fine hairs in there. I strongly believe that this is the feces of a large wild cat. In the part of the world I'm originally from, we often say panther for cougar, and I've been trying to remind myself to say cougar for the cougar or the mountain lion for quite a few years, and I mostly have it now, but when you hear me referencing panthers in that previous video using the original footage, I am referring to the pumakonkola or the mountain lion. The animal that left that scat was at least a meter long, not counting the tail. And the scat was quite large. It was the scat of a large predator. To me, that is the most conclusive evidence I have yet seen that cougars are back in Nova Scotia. But when I combine this with other spore that I found at other times in the past, and Lindsay Trask's most recent evidence of cougars in the area, I'd say the odds are hopeful. The cougar may well be back in Eastern Canada, and maybe in Upper New England as well. I'd certainly like to think so. The real question is, what kind of cougar? Are we looking at the western cougar? The panther from Florida? Are we looking at one of the Central American cougars having migrated over time and secretively up this way? In the same way that the coyote eventually made it up to northeastern North America coming out of the Mojave Desert so long ago? Or could we possibly be seeing the revival of the eastern cougar not long ago deemed to be extinct? Wouldn't that be amazing? In the meantime, my own quest for cougar spore, and if I am so lucky, actual video of the cougar will carry on. Please subscribe to The Naturalist, and as more news breaks on this story, I'll keep you informed.